All right. Um, I think I'm all wired up here. Great to be with you guys this afternoon. Um, and then I want to thank uh, Dr. Chris Toich for the opportunity and inviting me out here. Um, he was, until this year, was uh, our forward specialist in Virginia, one of our forward specialists. And I think you're really lucky to have him. He was really well respected by our producers and, and his colleagues. So you guys, I think you got a, a great, great um, specialist that's going to do a good job for you. Um, like the, I'm going to probably kind of add to some of what this other speaker said, hopefully give you a little bit different perspective on it um, and maybe a little different point of view. Uh, I think that's great to see different points of view and, and to try to see what is going to work best for you and, and your operation. Um, I am going to talk a little about herbicides, maybe not specific herbicides like Scott uh, Flynn did, or in specific weeds, um, although I probably will mention a couple. But I do want to say that, that if we're going straight to a herbicide, um, or if we're relying exclusively on a herbicide, like uh, Dr. Chris Toich said, um, for our, our weed management needs, we're probably going to fail. There's some other things we, we need to be doing. I, I want to start off, and, and Chris kind of mentioned this a little bit, um, I want to start off with a little bit of a, a history. This was a Carl Sprengel who came up with the, that theory of, of minimum, the plant growth is limited by the essential nutrient at the lowest concentration. Um, and that's certainly easily applicable to uh, soil fertility, uh, and plant growth, right? But I think it, it's, it's actually more broadly ap uh, applicable than that. Another way of, of saying this that you've probably heard of is, is a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, right? Um, and so if we kind of go to the, with the chain analogy or with, with this barrel analogy uh, with the lowest stave, we've got to figure out uh, what on, on the operation is the most limiting, right? Because that's where we really need to put our resources. Um, you know, if, if, if our, our weed management is up here, uh, then trying to address weed management may not improve our, our farm as much as uh, if, if our soil fertility is down here or, or vice versa. So um, I don't know what that is on, on your operation. You've got to figure that out, but I want you to kind of have that in mind uh, as, as we go through this. All right, so the goal of, of our pasture is, is livestock performance, right? And, and when we think about um, world-class athletes or Olympians, right? They're not just going out and eating, eating junk food and candy like it's like the night of Halloween, right? They're putting good things into their body. They have um, probably someone, a consultant, who's telling them, you know, what's good to eat, what's providing them the, the things they need for, for the, what they're doing with their bodies. And I think with our, our, our livestock, whether that's cattle or goats or sheep or whatever, we've got to be giving them a quality, quality um, and a forage. So we want a lot of it, and we want high quality, right? Uh, so how do we do that? How do we optimize our forage phase? Well, I think there's kind of three things we've got to be doing. Of course, we've got to select the right varieties and some other stuff. But provided you've got those, those foundational things, managing the forage you've got, we've got to do these three things in concert. We need proper soil fertility. And by that, I mean taking and following uh, soil tests and following those recommendations. We've got to have good hang and grazing management. And I think we're also going to have to have, have weed management in there. We're not going to be able to get good weed management with, by just those two, three, two things alone. Uh, so I think this is a, a three-legged stool. And we really, if, to get the most benefit out of, out of that wood there, we need really to have all three things, all three of these legs in place. All right, so we're going to go into each of these a little bit, uh, sort of with an eye on weed management before I go into to the weed management kind of uh, more formally. But proper soil fertility, what that is doing for us is giving our, our desirable species the best chance to, to thrive, to be competitive, right? And so we want to increase the density of those and the competitiveness of those, because that's really what's going to help us combat the weeds. Another way of saying that is just saying that it's going to shift the competitive advantage uh, towards our desirable species and, and hopefully away from our weeds, right? Uh, so uh, weeds will take up fertility or fertilizer, just like our desirable grasses uh, will. Um, but hopefully, um, in the process of that, we can make those, those desirable species more competitive. So there, there is not a whole lot of research on this. We, we do know it works a lot uh, anecdotally, but what the research I've seen is was uh, the survey that was conducted in Missouri by Dr. Kevin Bradley. So they surveyed uh, 46 pastures in Missouri uh, for what weeds were growing in each of those pastures. And they also took a really detailed uh, soil sample from, from each of those pastures. And they were able to correlate what weeds were there uh, and what the, the soil fertility levels were and figure out what that is, is doing for us. And this is kind of just a cross management of, of various um, uh, grazers. So good management, bad management, kind of in between. These were the, the top uh, 10 species they found. 
Uh, on those pastures in Missouri, I think we have these are pretty much ubiquitous pasture weeds uh, probably across the, the eastern United States. So horse nettle, uh, that's probably our number one weed in Virginia. I'm sure it's, it's right up there in, in Kentucky as well. Uh, the other thing they have on, on here is, is whether it was uh, grazed. So if there's any evidence of grazing, they would note that or uh, whether it was avoided by the cows. Um, and so you can see some of that there. There's some interesting information. So, so when they put the what weeds were there and, and what the soil fertility was, what did, uh, actually, let me I'm get ahead of myself here. Um, what, so that was what their weed status was. What was their soil fertility status? Uh, they found that 80% of their pasture, so you know, by far and away, the majority of their pastures would be low or very low in soil phosphorus levels. And about a third of those pastures were low or very low in the potassium levels, in their K levels. Their average soil pH was a, a 5.8, so that's a little bit lower than we'd like to see. So that's kind of kind of where they were across the board. When they put those two things together, the weeds and the fertility, what they found was is that a one unit increase in soil pH resulted in about 4,000 fewer weeds per acre. Okay, so it really mattered there. Now, soil pH, you know, we want it kind of six, six and a half, maybe you know somewhere in there, uh, depending on what what our desirable species are and, and what you know what our limitations are with that piece of ground. Uh, we don't want to go all over to seven or eight. <laughs> we might be able to, to lime, lime it and do that enough, but um, uh, we, we want to optimize it. And that uh, thing, what this is showing is that when we optimize it, we will result in, in fewer weeds. I um, thought I had changed that, but so a one part per million unit increase in P and K corresponds to 61 and 12 fewer weeds per acre, respectively. Uh, so I think when you do the math there, that would be a, a, a one pound per acre increase would be about 120 and about 24 weeds uh, fewer, respectively. So it can help us and can make a difference. All right, so that's kind of a little bit about uh, soil fertility. What about grazing and, and hay management? Uh, and what you've heard with, with this rotational grazing and those, the speakers that have talked to that is that we're, we're really seeing a lot of benefits. And I think one of the benefits is also going to be uh, weed suppression. And by that one, we're going to have a lot more leaf area out there. Um, and that's going to cast more shade on some of those, those annual weeds, especially that are trying to compete. Uh, it's also going to help the, the, that desirable forages thrive, which again is uh, giving a competitive advantage over the weeds. Uh, so what we see here is that the residual height affects the, the regrowth rate of, of that pasture. So if we take our pasture, uh, graze it all the way down to two inches here, for example, our growth rate in pounds of acre per day is going to be about 25, 30, right? So, uh, if we come down, t if we graze it only down to four inches, you know, we're getting somewhere over here, maybe 45, 50 pounds of, of growth per acre per day. So we can, more, we can double it or maybe more than double the, the amount of time we're, we're putting more grass back on that pasture. And so that grass is rebounding quicker, which is, again, giving a, an advantage of it as a grass over uh, a weed that's going to take longer to respond to that. Uh, and leaving that residual leaf area, uh, in resting pastures uh, is important because we can actually grow more than a, a, a third more forage in a giving season by doing that. So it seems like, you know, if we want to graze it down, we're going to get all the grass that's out there. Maybe that's best for us. But actually, if we leave some, it's going to recover quicker and we can grow more that year. So again, more than just uh, weed management benefits here. Uh, so a couple more studies that show that, that that residue out there, that leaf area, that litter out there is helping us control weeds or suppress weeds. Um, here, basically, they found that as, as that leaf area increased, the weed density was, was decreasing. And they've kind of found that the optim, optimal there was about 1,300 pounds of, of dry matter minimized weeds. Uh, the other study, again, was that, that survey in Missouri that Dr. Kevin Bradley did. They found a 1% increase in forage ground cover had over 250 fewer weeds uh, per acre. So I think this 1% is, is, you know, you don't think of that as being a whole lot, but it definitely is. 283 weeds is, is a bigger number than I thought it would be. So those things uh, can and are helping us battle, battle the weeds. And I think those are critically important to have those in place uh, before we start looking at things like, like herbicides. All right, so what about weed management? Um, and we sort of said this or implied this today, is that the weeds uh, reduce forage yield uh, and they reduce our forage quality. Um, now certainly we have a lot higher tolerance for weeds in our pasture systems than we do in, in like a row crop setting. Um, so it's not always going to result in a decrease in yield or decrease in quality. But certainly there, there's a threshold there um, that, that they are going to do that. Uh, certainly this, this picture is kind of an extreme example of that. Uh, they can ca also cause 
animal injury. So whether they've got thorns or spines, and whether that's poking them, maybe leading to pink eye. Um, you know, it, maybe we can debate that a little bit whether they're they're tolerant or not uh, to that. Uh, but if they're poisonous and that's getting in the belly of the animal and 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 killing an animal, that's certainly not a good thing, right? Uh, so we want to definitely avoid the, the poisonous weeds that are out there, and that can um, maybe ratchet up the, the uh, importance of that weed. Another thing is they're going to reduce the forage utilization, and I've got some data on that. But, but the forage out there, um, it, it doesn't do us any good unless we get it into the belly of that animal, right? Whether that's we're looking at the weeds as a forage or the, the grasses or the clover as a forage, it's great if it's there, but if it's not getting into the animal, then it doesn't really matter for us. And so we'll look at that. Uh, so when we look at a herbicide, it's pretty easy to see the, the, the benefits here. And this is just a, a tall iron weed here. This is Grazon Next, uh, a plot of that one year after treatment. So you can really see, see the difference there. But does that actually translate to uh, a benefit for us uh, as a producer? Um, so controlling weeds can lead to, to more grass. Again, you've got to kind of be over the threshold there of it being your most limiting uh, item on your farm or on your pasture. Uh, but it can lead to, to more grass grown. So this is just a, a strip demonstration where the herbicide was applied, they let it, um, the weeds die and the grass recover from that treatment and then went out there and sampled it. And you see where the herbicide was applied, here's your desirable grass species and a small bundle of, of weeds where the herbicide was not applied, so no weed control, uh, uh, you know, much smaller bag of, of desirable grasses, much larger bundle of weeds. And that actually resulted in over a doubling the amount of desirable forage that was grown on there by controlling those weeds. I mentioned utilization, and this is the, the study I'm going to show on this. Is, this is actually conducted uh, by my predecessor at Virginia Tech, Dr. Scott Haygood. And they were looking at the control of horse nettle, and then um, what, was, what was utilized of the desirable forage by the, the cows there. Um, and so sometimes you'll see this, although not all times, but you'll see that kind of ring around a horse nettle plant. Of, of ungrazed grass where they've just sort of they've grazed around it but the thorns are there or whatever is there in the horse nettle they don't want to get near that so they will leave that grass so again if that grass is there but not getting into the animal it's not doing us any good so the various various herbicide treatments uh, here and then the, then the uh, percent uh, control or percent utilization over here uh, and, and the, the green bars are the control of horse nettle uh, so you can see as, as Control of horse nettle improved here with the, the graze on next from one to up to two, two pints went from 80 to, to 94% control there. Our utilization of that desirable forage also went up from 70 to 80%, which is pretty high utilization. But I think the, the trend is what's important is that we were getting, uh, as we controlled weeds, we had more utilization of the forage. We look at that compared to some herbicide treatments that didn't work as well or, or the non-treated where we had no control of horse nettle only a third of that forage was, was utilized by the animals, okay? So that's, that's definitely helping us out, helping us out. All right, so what do, what do the cows prefer? What do the cattle prefer if we just um, let them have the choice? And uh, Dr. Chris Toich showed a little bit of this, but this is that, that GPS trackers on the collars um, so they could, they could keep track of where the animals were uh, in the pasture and they had uh, a her uh, pasture that was, half of it was sprayed with a herbicide, half of it was left uh, non-treated. And the animals were free to roam uh, either side, which, which, which they chose here. So you see some various pictures here. Some of it's you know, more weedy, some, of it's, some parts of it are less weedy. Uh, and, and here's what it looks like prior to grazing, uh, so that, or sorry, prior to herbicide application. So um, you see the shape of, of the overall pasture here. And then this was kind of the dividing line between uh, the, this upper left side was uh, treated with the herbicide and the blue dots in that area on the lower right side uh, were not treated. So before treatment here, you see about 50-50 split between where the animals spent their time. So they had, uh, you know, as much as, as possible equal access to shade, to water, to, to nutrient supplements, et cetera. One month after application, where, where did the cows spend their time? Well, it's still about 50-50 mixture, right? So, so what's happening there? Well, the herbicide is going to take a little while to actually kill the weeds, right? It's going to take, uh, with good growing conditions, depending on the herbicide, three to four weeks to kill those plants. Um, then the grasses need a little bit of time to re recover from that, right? To, to respond to the lack of, of competition of those weeds. Uh, so when you go to four months um, into the experiment, uh, we're seeing a huge split between where the, 
the cows were spending their time in that pasture. So 77% of the time they were on that, that treated side, where, or the weed-free side, uh, versus 23% on, on the um, non-treated side. When you combine all those together across four months, uh, including that first month where we really didn't see a divergence, it was about a 70-30 split. So the cows really preferred the, the lack of weeds there. Uh, now, the one thing we have as far as our herbicides go is we're going to kill the clovers with our herbicides, right? We can't really control weeds without also killing our clovers. That's just the, the, where we are. And so even when, when giving access to the clovers here, when the clovers are dead up here, that's what the animals still prefer. Okay. So I think that's a little background and kind of where I'm coming from, weed management, pastures. I want to go into, into herbicides and then kind of integrating herbicides with other techniques. Uh, so how to successfully use a herbicide. First thing I think we've got to do is, is dispel some, some pasture myths. And I kind of got just, just said one of those. But one thing, and that's been said before today, is that we, we will never completely control our weeds, right? Um, it's just something I think we really need to focus on managing our weeds. Because uh, trying to eradicate a weed forever off our farm is just simply not practical, and it's certainly not an economical thing to do. Um, so, so we're never going to completely control the weeds. We've got to focus on managing weeds. And I think that's something we're perfectly capable of doing and we've got a lot of tools to help us do that. There is no silver bullet. There is no, uh, you know, Michael, what's the best herbicide? Well, I, it, I don't know. Uh, it depends on what weeds you have, depending on what time of year it is, depending on what your desirable species are, um, all those kinds of things. So there's nothing that we can just spray and it's going to kill all the weeds. Um, or something, there's really nothing we can spray every uh, June 1st, you know. If I just spray this every June 1st, I won't have to worry about weeds. No, we don't, we don't have that either, okay? Uh, so again, it's, it's a management thing. This is the one I said earlier, there, there are not effective herbicides that are safe to clovers. And so we're going to have to manage that situation as well. If, we want, if we've got a lot of clovers out there, maybe we're able to tolerate a few, uh, few more weeds. But if we just got a couple clovers here and there, probably aren't really doing us that much good. And we've got a whole pile of weeds, maybe, maybe a herbicide treatment's good there. If, you've, if, you've got, if you're thinking about seeding clovers, though, um, and you've got some weeds, Really, we need to talk about trying to control those weeds before you seed the clovers, before you make that investment, because after you make the investment, you know, <laughs> we can't really kill the weeds with the herbicide uh, without, you know, just wasting that investment in the clover seed. The other thing I would say is it's, a lot of times it's not going to happen overnight. You know, our, our climax vegetation in the eastern United States is a forest, right? And that's what, if we just leave the land alone, it's going to eventually go back to a forest, all right? And so if we got some of these kind of later successional species, these brushy, woody species coming in, you know, a lot of times we're, we're kind of on, it, it took us years to get there, and it's not just going to go back overnight. So that's just something we've got to, to realize um, that it's going to take some time, time and effort. All right, so successfully using a herbicide. The first thing we've got to do is successfully identify the weed, right? Uh, if we don't know what weed we have, we have no idea of, of <laughs> how to deal with it. We don't really have any information about it. So we've got to identify that weed. Luckily, there's uh, some resources to help us with that. Obviously, our friends and neighbors, co-op is usually a pretty good resource for a lot of our weeds. Uh, obviously, as an extension specialist, I think extension is a great resource uh, for us to help us do with that. Um, we have the Virginia Tech Weed Guide, so if you just Google VT Weeds, there's a lot of good pictures on there. Um, it's a little bit outdated as far as its looks. We're working on that. Um, it's a good resource if you want to confirm that I think, I think this is uh, wing stem or I think this is nimble will. Uh, but if you have really no idea what weed it is, then, then it's really, <laughs> there's, I think there's about 600 weeds on there, at least 500. And you're going to spend a lot of time looking at pictures that aren't what you're looking for. So if, if that's the situation you're in, I'd, I'd recommend uh, this ID Weeds. Um, this, it's, a, it's a good app. It also works as a website. If you just um, Google, it's, this is, and this is from the University of Missouri as well. So if you just Google Missouri Weed Identification, you should be able to come right up. That's a resource that allows you, um, you can just select various things about your weeds, and it'll kind of narrow that list down. So you could say, is this a grass weed or a broadleaf weed? Uh, are the leaves uh, opposite or alternate? And it's got some pictures to help you with some of those botanical terms on it. So that should help you narrow down the list pretty, pretty, pretty well. Uh, and there's also some, some books available. Weeds of the Northeast, I think, is one of the better picture references out there. Uh, but again, if you have no idea what it is, you're going to be kind of thumbing through a lot of pictures there. But we've got to identify that weed because that's going to tell us a lot about the weed, especially about how we need to manage that weed. Uh, so what is the life cycle of that weed? Is that an annual weed or is that a, a perennial weed? 
It's going to be there year after year. How competitive is it um, with, with our species? Uh, is it something that we're able to graze or something where we can um, mow it out or, or uh, at least maintain a, a low pressure of that weed by mowing? Uh, does it have good forage quality? Is it poisonous? Uh, palatability? We, there's a lot of information that we need to know to properly manage that weed. So we've got to, we've got to figure out what the weed is. For applying a herbicide, um, the life cycle is really the biggest indicator of when we want to apply that herbicide. So if it's an annual weed, when it's young and actively growing, we can do a, a, a lot of good. We can sometimes use a, a cheaper herbicide or sometimes a, a lower rate of herbicide, but definitely we're going to be more effective with kind of regardless of what herbicide we use when we apply it to when it's young and actively growing. Uh, you get to the end of the season, and now it's kind of a little bit late to, for this example, but a summer annual like uh, spiny, spiny amaranth right now, it's basically, it's got all the seed on the plant. It's probably already shed a lot of those. It's kind of all but dead. It's just waiting on something to kind of kick it over for the winter, and it's done, right? So there's really nothing going on there for the herbicide to, to work on and to kill that plant. Uh, but conversely, our winter annuals right now are, are, are coming up, um, and now is actually a pretty good time to work on some winter annual weeds because right now is when they're young and actively growing. Our biennial weeds, and, and mainly this is our thistles in pastures, uh, the seedling stage, so again, like an annual when they're young and actually growing, or this overwintering uh, rosette stage is really a, a good time to apply those. Once those thistles start bolting up, you know, kind of late spring or, or into, definitely into, into midsummer, there's really nothing much we can do with the herbicide at that point to control those. We've kind of missed, missed the opportunity. Perennial weeds, there's, there's two schools of thought. Um, there's this early bud stage timing or there's the, the fall timing. Uh, of those, I, just as a general rule, I'd prefer that early bud stage. But the idea is that you're, you've got an underground structure that's, that has a lot of energy stored in it. We've either got to get a herbicide down there to kill it or we've got to weaken it enough to where it can't come back. And so this early bud stage or just prior to flowering, the, the plants put all, a lot of that energy from those underground structures into making that above ground portion of the plant. And right before um, flowering is usually when it's used most of that energy up. So if we can apply the herbicide right then and kill it, it has much, much less chance of, of coming back from that herbicide because the energy has been depleted. Uh, the other timing is, is in the fall, and the, the, the plants can sense when the day is getting shorter, the nights are getting cooler, it needs to start stocking up for winter. So it's sending all those, those sugars and carbohydrates, it's producing photosynthesis down in the plant. And the idea is that you can, by applying that time of year, the herbicides will move a little bit better down into those underground storage structures because a lot of the translocation is moving uh, that direction. Um, so those, those are the timings there for that. Uh, so you know, I don't know if we're doing this as well as we could. You know, I get, when I get questions, that's what this is, uh, most of the questions I get here are, are July, August, and September, right? Now certainly there's, there's, that's good for some of our weed species, but a lot of these weed species, it's, we're, we're missing the boat. And so uh, when I get you know, asked in September about a summer annual weed, the recommendation is, well, you know, next year is a good time to try to do something about it because we haven't really got there this year. So, um, so just something to, something to think about. Uh, this, this information, I've kind of split it up here just to fit it on the slides a little better, but this is in the proceedings uh, for this meeting. This is sort of the optimal time of year for application of, of herbicides to selected weeds. So this is grouped uh, at, at the top of it by uh, winter annual weeds, summer annual weeds, and by annual weeds, and you can see uh, when that is. So summer annual weeds, you know, May and June is really when those plants are young and actively growing and when we can get the most efficacy from those herbicides. Winter annuals, I said right now, is, is really kind of start till right now up into, um, depending on when you get a really hard frost or when it starts really staying cold, um, we can get pretty good effectiveness of herbicides now in winter annual weeds. For our perennial weeds, uh, it, it really kind of, like I said, the, the early bud stage is, is the rule, but there are, there's always exceptions to that rule. A couple that I'd point out here, uh, for me, uh, Carolina horse nettle, you really, that's going to be a little bit later. That's when that full flowering time is really best for that weed. Uh, and you can see some of these, these others that are up there. All right, so what to apply? Uh, we've also included the, the Virginia Tech, and there's actually a, um, I believe that the, uh, there's a handout included in, in, in one of the appendix of, the, of a Kentucky uh, recommendations as well. But, but the point is you've got a, a lot of different herbicide choices up here for you in, in grass pastures and forages. 
Um, and then we've got a lot of different weeds here. So winter annual weeds, summer annual weeds, and this, this table kind of keeps going into uh, biennial weeds, perennial weeds that are split up to herbaceous perennials and then woody perennials. And so the numbers on here are, are basically a 1 to 10 scale. And so 10 being 100% you know, effective or, or highly effective, 95% or better. And then 7 would be like 70% effective. Uh, we have some, some like dashes on here, uh, which is basically we don't have any data. It's not on the label and we don't have any data. So, but we, we wanted to include, you know, if we had information on a lot of the herbicides, but maybe not this one, we still wanted to include that information in the table. A couple of these will have an L, like, like here's an L. That means it's labeled, but we don't have any university data to, to corroborate that. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I think this is really useful table because it's never just one weed, right? It's usually two, three, four weeds you have in your pasture and trying to figure out what herbicides gonna be best for you can, can be fairly complicated, especially when you're just, you're just looking at herbicide labels online or something. So, uh, you know, you can kind of make a nice happy compromise. And you're probably gonna have to compromise on the timing of that herbicide application as well. Uh, you know, because something, one weed might be, um, you know, earlier to emerge, and so when it's young and actually growing, it's a little bit different timing than a different weed. So it's always a little bit of a, a management, but hopefully this is important information that can help you with these. Last thing I'll say about these numbers are, are these are based on uh, kind of four, six, sometimes eight weeks after, after application. Uh, these aren't like a year after application like Scott was talking about with some of those, uh, those herbicides. So that's, that's what these are based on. They're also based on um, optimal application timing to, to small weeds to, to the size that's indicated on the herbicide label. Uh, and also in adequate environmental conditions, all right? So if we, we go out and it's uh, the high is 35 for that day and we spray our herbicide, it's not going to be very effective, I can tell you that right now. Um, if it hasn't rained in three weeks and we go out there on something that's shallow rooted, it's not really actively growing, uh, so it's not going to be very effective. So those are some, some other considerations to make. So some of, what are the, the big herbicide mistakes <laughs> that we see out there? Uh, one of those is, I would say, is definitely the wrong application timing. Uh, you know, I got to it when I could. I, I totally understand that. <laughs> I know you guys are probably busier than I am. Um, my problem is, is I'm away from home, so when I come back to, to go do it, sometimes we've, we've missed the, app, the optimal window there. Uh, but, but getting that timing, you know, we're making this investment in the herbicide, investment in the pasture, we really got to make sure that that timing is, is key to our success. Uh, use, use the wrong product, all right? Like I said, I can't tell you what the best herbicide is, all right? Uh, the cheapest thing they've got at the co-op is it may not be the best herbicide. It might be the best herbicide for the weeds you have, but it, it may not be. So uh, they're not all created equal. They're not all equally effective on, on a variety of weeds. So we've got to make sure we're, we're choosing the right product. Um, misidentification of the weed. Again, we've got we've to identify the weeds so we know what we're dealing with. Uh, this one, stickweed, is, is, could be three or four different species in Virginia. <laughs> it seems like if it's upright and, and it's something they don't want in the pasture, stickweed's a, a good name for it. And so I've always got to be careful when I'm on the phone of, of trying to figure out what we're actually talking about uh, before I make a, a recommendation there. We've got to put out the right, right uh, herbicide rate. You know, I, I get that if you can come out with a half rate, you know, it just costs you half as much for the herbicide, uh, but a lot of times that's not effective, right? So. If, it's, if the recommendation is a quart of 2,4-D, you put out a pint, you know, your expectations of how that herbicide is going to perform should kind of be cut in half. You know. um, maybe not quite cut in half, but it's not going to be as good as we want it to be. Uh, last thing I'd say is we didn't calibrate the sprayer, right? Uh, sometimes <laughs> you start asking questions and, and, you know, tank full, how far is that tank full going to go it can vary kind of widely. Uh, again, we're kind of rolling, we're turning, uh, we're up and down, but uh, we, we've got to have that sprayer calibrated because if we, if we, you know, if, 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 we, if we go real slow and we, we don't cover much ground, we probably put on way too much herbicide and we might be happy with the control, but we spent too much money on it. Uh, conversely, if, if we go real fast, we cover a lot of ground, maybe we're not so happy with the weed control because we, we put a cut rate on, essentially, is what we did there. So, All right, so that's some stuff about herbicides and certainly that's not the whole gamut of what you need to know about herbicides. You know, there's, there's grazing uh, restrictions and haying restrictions. Uh, there's adjuvants or surfactants that need to go in some herbicides that don't go in others. Um, and a lot of that's in our, our pest management guide. Um, but I think those are, those are really the basics. How can we integrate these with, with some of our other management practices? Well, mowing is certainly an, another practice we do quite routinely for, for weed management. 
Um, and this is the sort of a theoretical response of a perennial weed to mowing. That is, so you start of the year, and our energy reserves going from low to high. You start out the year with pretty high uh, energy reserves in that, that underground storage of that perennial plant, right? And as the spring comes, it starts to grow, and that uses up the energy. So the energy level goes down, right? And this would be where we, you know, where you'd want to put on that herbicide, right, before it starts flowering, because that's where that energy level is lowest. Now, if we don't mow it, we don't put on the herbicide, it, it goes to flowering, and it starts building back up energy more for the winter. And, you know, when you get to your winter frost and it's kind of dormant for the year, that's where you end up. The idea with mowing or herbicide application or other weed management technique is hopefully right here we can, we can do something. We can mow that plant, we mow, and that's going to force that plant to, to make more top growth, more above ground growth, and that's going to use up more energy, right? So we go down a little bit more, uh, and then we hack it off again, and we can use it up a little bit more until there's basically no energy left, right? And the plant can't come back from that. Now, the, the textbook here says, you know, for control, and of course this depends on the, the weed species we're talking about, three to six mowings per year for one to three seasons. Uh, it's going to be hard to grow much forage when you're mowing it off that much, right? <laughs> so, and, and certainly it's, it's, we're spending a lot of money on, and time uh, to, to get that result. So I don't think mowing by itself is really uh, a, a, a very effective weed management. It certainly can help us uh, with some things, and so we'll talk about that. But, but the reason here is, is because the grass, again, is like uh, Dr. Toich mentioned, its growing point is, is down low. And so by mowing this off, it can really recover from, uh, from that mowing event much quicker uh, per, com as compared to a broadleaf, like here's a uh, common cockle burr. Its growing points are up in the air, right? So when we cut those off, it actually has to uh, generate new growing points and, and come back, and it just takes it a lot longer to recover from that event. So a properly timed mowing event can give us a competitive advantage to our, our desirable grass species. And then most of our clovers are a little bit below the mowing or we're not, you know, we're going to keep our, our clovers by doing that. One weed I think we can do, uh, can help us with mowing is, is stickweed or, or one of these, this is one of the weeds that we call stickweed in Virginia, wing stem or yellow crown beard. It's got these kind of wings on the stem here. Um, and then, well, it's probably looking a little more beat up like than this right now. But as about a month ago, you probably saw all those yellow flowers on the top of it. It's, it gets uh, real tall, and it's, it's not exactly the most bushy thing in the world, right? So stickweed is, is a pretty good name for it. Um, if, if you wait for that early bud stage, you know, sometimes it's six feet tall before it sets that flower, and then we're trying to get a spray boom over top of that, and that can be kind of complicated. But if we come and we mow this thing down, we, we, um, we disrupt what's called apical dominance. That's going to release those, those lateral buds down lower on the plant, and so it's actually going to come back from mowing a little bit bushier. So, so the mowing is going to deplete its underground energy reserves, and now we're going to have a bushier plant, a lower plant that we can more easily get that spray broom across. And hopefully we've got more leaf area there versus this one kind of one stem upright where we have kind of a little bit more of a bush. So we can actually give a, get a higher dose, with more inter leaf area there for the herbicide to be intercepted. So that's, that's kind of my, my approach here with some of those. Another thing I'd say uh, about mowing is, is sometimes it's kind of a waste of forage. And I know uh, uh, Scott Flynn mentioned this earlier. So this is a, a weedy site we went into. We dropped these things down, um, and we sampled what was there, divided into grass, weeds, and clovers, mowed it, uh, put these down in another area, you know, randomly in, in that area, in that mowed area, and sampled it again, divided up into grass, weeds, and clovers. And uh, here's what we found. So it changed from initial after mowing, we, we reduce the weed biomass, that above ground biomass, by 96%. You've seen that. You bush hog your pasture and it looks nice and clean there right after you did it. Here we had a lot of stickweed or wing stem in that pasture, so that was a lot of the weight that we got rid of. So really, we, um, at least the, the above ground biomass of the weed, we did a good job on. We also, though, we wasted about half of our grass and half of our clover. All right, so 54 and 47% uh, reduction. In what, so we, we just took that and we just put it on the ground and kind of just wasted it, okay? so. Again, another management thing to consider is something that we're, we're wasting some of our forage when we do that. Two months after mowing, we came back, and, and here's what some of the plots looked like. Uh, a lot of regrowth there on that, that uh, wing stem. Okay? So uh, temporarily, uh, good increase. We, I think we would have had a much better grass response, but we mowed it, and then the rain didn't come for, for three or four weeks, and so we didn't get very good response there. When you look at uh, a mowing compared to a herbicide application, 
these these things are going to look somewhat different. Here's a you know nice weedy pasture due to sin. Um, so we, that was a picture of, of July 2016. Three months later, September. Here's what these plots look like. Mowed in, mowed in July. Again, you're seeing that regrowth. The graze on next actually looks really nice and clean there. Uh, mowed there just prior to this picture taken. You see all this, the sticks and stuff down there. Okay, so um, uh, of these three, I think the, the graze on looks the best. When you come back a year after that, Obviously, mowing isn't something we're going to think is going to really last more than a year, and, and you can see that whether you did it in July or September. Uh, we had had all the weeds come back on us. But graze on next, you know, there's there's a couple weeds in here, so not complete weed control, uh, and the, the fescue's uh, kind of tall and rank there because it hasn't been grazed. But um, but that's you know I think a lot better looking uh, than this. When you look at the again taking a forage sample of that and dividing up in the grass weeds and clover. Mowed earlier, mowed late. The majority of what was out there in these blue bars is, is weeds. At the herbicide bar, we have a lot fewer weeds there, right? Not completely eliminated, but we did have a lot fewer weeds. Grass bars, though, in the red, you know, not a whole lot of grass out there. A lot more grass where, where the grazon next was applied. Clovers, though, again, we, we completely eliminated the clovers out of here. So we were able to uh, kind of maintain what the clover was in that pasture by, by not applying the herbicide. All right. So, so another, some more data on integrating these practices, uh, mowing versus a herbicide and then adding some fertilizer in here. So this is a forage response to weed control mowing and fertilizer. So this is, is yield, so tall bars are, are better if it's our desirable species, uh, tall bars are bad if it's our weed species. And so the, the desirable grass is in green and black are, is the weed bar. So you can see when we did nothing, we had a little over 4,000 pounds per acre of weeds. Um, and maybe 1,500 pounds per acre of grass. So a good weedy site to go in and do, do a herbicide weed management research in. Where it was mowed, again, uh, we were able to, to grow more grass there, that, that recovery period where the weeds were sampled, though we still had some weeds. And so when you think about these weeds as far as these could still be reducing the utilization of that, the quality of that forage, uh, and potentially these could be poisonous weeds, okay? So just because we did a good job of, of reducing the weeds compared to the, to the check or the control, doesn't mean we, we did as good as we could have done. Uh, where we uh, mow, well, let's jump to where we fertilize it only. If we just fertilize this pasture, and again, I think the, the control shows you that the weeds are probably the most limiting, uh, that's our weakest link in the chain on this pasture, right? So if we just go out there and fertilize it, well, the weeds are actually what responded most of that fertilizer, right? They took up a lot of that fertilizer. We grew a little bit more grass than, than the control, um, but Definitely the weeds are what, what took it up. When you look at combining mowing and fertility, you know, we didn't really see a, a huge benefit between um, mowing or mowing with fertility. Again, a, a bigger benefit went to the weeds as far as that was concerned. Come over here to the, to the herbicide and the herbicide plus fertility. Uh, you can see we eliminated the weeds with that herbicide in this, and we, we grew uh, as much grass as we did with, with mowing here. But we did the combination, that's really, really the best one, right? We grew a whole lot of grass. And, and it was weed free. So again, we've got to be doing these, these things in concert. All right, another, uh, and we've heard about this before, another technique to manage weeds is to try to graze the weeds, right? Uh, whether you do that through training the animals or try to do it through multi-species grazing, I think we just need to realize that there's, like with anything else, there's, there's potential uh, benefits and uh, potential costs of that. So some of the benefits to, to this is we have less effect on our non-target species. And so, like I said, we apply a herbicide, we're going to kill those clovers. If we graze them out, we're probably going to be able to keep those clovers. We're going to have some natural fertility return, right? That, that manure is going to be deposited in the pasture, and so we can convert maybe the weeds into some fertility, which would be a good thing. We reduce our, our pesticide use, uh, potentially have lower direct costs, uh, and potentially convert some of our weeds into an animal product. So whether that's beef or uh, whether that's milk or whatever that product is coming off the pasture, you know, weeds may be able to convert it into that. So those are some benefits, but there's also some costs of these, right? We have capital costs of the animals. If we want to introduce goats on the farm, we don't have goats, we've got to get some goats, right? We've got to go buy them, right? we could borrow them, but we're going to have to, there's going to be some expense there. Uh, we also might have some extra fencing or animal care needs. Uh, certainly uh, management, I think, is going to be ratcheted up with, with multi-species grazing here. Um, the loss of animal condition or, or weight gain on the animal, I think that's certainly a risk that's out there. 
it may happen, it may not happen, depending on you know what animals are, uh, are the animals eating those weeds or which weeds those are or the effects. But it's something that, that um, can happen, uh, so something you need to be aware of. Uh, reduce the value in the animal products such as wool. Uh, you're probably not going to have complete weed control, so I don't think that should be the expectation going in there. Um, we're just like as we're not going to have complete weed control with uh, a lot of our, our pasture herbicides. All right, but hopefully the idea is, again, just getting those down to a manageable level where those aren't the limiting factor in your operation. Uh, the spread of weed seeds in, in feces, hair, or hooves, I think is something we definitely want to be concerned about. Um, and some of the research shows that we can actually make these, these, these weed problems worse, uh, depending on how our management is. This has been shown by uh, several of the uh, presenters that weeds can be nutritious. Uh, I think what I would just remind you is, is that as, as the weeds progress through their life cycle, as they mature from a vegetative kind of early growth stage through flowering and then the, putting on that fruit or seed head, their, their forage quality is going down uh, for the most part. Okay? So trying to get animals out there when they're young and tender, just like we would for our grasses, is, is important when, when managing weeds. Now I think it makes it a little bit harder, obviously, because we've got several weed species again, if we just have a big big broad area of grass that's all managed the same, it's going to kind of hit those stages at the same time, right? We got, you know, four or five different species, you know, when they're the most palatable and when they're most easily grazed is going to be very different across those species. And so that, that can be a definite challenge when trying to, to graze weeds. All right. So this is uh, common ragweed here. And, and you see this is when it's, when it's young and actively growing. And so one of the, the management challenges here is that this is when animals are going to most prefer. It's going to be the most palatable. It's probably going to be most digestible, et cetera. This is also when it's the most susceptible to a herbicide, right? We can, we can easily control this uh, with a little bit of 240 or a little bit of dicamba right now, okay? Um, now, we're going to kill that clover in the process, um, but this is, this is, that's just a, a management decision you've got to make. If we don't do anything about it or, or if we graze it a little bit and then the animals stop grazing it for whatever reason. Here it is at the end of the season, right? So you see a whole bunch of ragweed, a whole bunch of seed there that are going to be problematic for next year. Um, and maybe the animals will eat that, maybe they won't. Getting to that clover, you know, we kept our clover, but did it really do us any good here? I, you know, I don't know. I, don't, <laughs> I would say probably not. Um, but, but that's a, a management decision you've got to make. I think using management... Uh, using livestock to manage weeds, it, it can be successful. Again, sometimes it may be not so successful. And I think you'll see that in the data here. So this is some work out of New Zealand where they were looking at um, uh, goats uh, and sheep and mixtures thereof. You see all sheep set socked. The flowers on these thistles were well, the highest with the marsh thistle and the bull thistle here at 35, where we had some goats in the mixture, kind of regardless of whether it was 100% goats or, or two-thirds or a third goats. They're able to keep that at more of a management, uh, uh, manageable level there. Uh, so depending on what, what species you have and, and what they're doing, maybe it's good for us, maybe it's bad. Here's some cows eating some thistle. And, you know, and this is an extreme example for sure uh, because there's no grass there. There's, no other, there's nothing else there for them to eat. So of, of course they're going to eat that. After they eat it, though, one, I think another thing we need to think about, though, is, is the recuperative potential of these broadleaf species is not what our grass species are, right? And so, so we, maybe we got some benefits out of grazing that thistle, but trying to, to do something with this now is, is tough, right? It's going to be a year, maybe two years, before those thistles are back to where they're grazable, where it might just be you know, 40, 50 days before grass is actually, uh, we can rotate back through there. Also, a lot of erosion potential here, I'd say. Another thing, this is a, a mob grazed area where we had pokeweed. Um, so pokeweed is a poisonous plant. They left this pokeweed alone, but this one here, and I've kind of blown it up in the background here for you, this one was grazed, okay? So it's a pretty poisonous weed, and that, that scares me, okay? So we've got to make sure we're aware of what's out in our pastures, and we're not getting our animals to eat that. I think I'm getting close on time here, so I'm going to skip to this. Again, I think it's nuanced. Sometimes we can do good, sometimes we can do bad with this. Continuous grazing in, in this study of Canada thistle actually resulted in increased infestations and decreased forage yield. As, as compared to uh, high intensity, low, low uh, frequency um, grazing infestations actually reduce the yields. So how we're managing those things can impact on, on whether those are successful or, or a failure depending on your, your definition of that. 
Um, too intense defoliations annually over two or three years nearly eliminated the stem. So again, doing it where these too intense defoliations got it down to what I would say a management level. Um, I'm going to just conclude by just kind of reminding you that there's, there's some fall annual, uh, fall weed control opportunities. Now's a good time to be thinking about that. If you go back to what was your problems last spring, that's what's coming up or has come up already in your pastures right now. So if you saw a big field of yellow buttercups, some of those are up, probably more are on their way right now. So just a reminder to be, to be thinking of that. So I'm, I'm going to end there. And uh, again, thanks for the opportunity to be here and happy to entertain any questions you have. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.